Good morning, folks. This is the uh, presentation in the lab nine of week nine of this course. And uh, I actually uh, taped, the, uh, taped the entire presentation, but when I tried to save it, it came out as damaged uh, MP4 uh, uh, file. So because I didn't want to go through this thing again, it took me about an hour to do that. I don't want, I didn't want to go through it again. What I have done is appended to this uh, particular uh, first uh, minute of the, the video, uh, the same presentation that I made last year, uh, and uh, that'll take care of it, okay? Underneath it says uh, uh, summer of 2023, and you can see why, because uh, my, my, uh, my video my video didn't come out to be properly uh, formatted this, this year, all right? Thank you. Hello, folks. This is uh, lab number nine in week number nine. And on the agenda today, I have the following topics to discuss. The first thing that I want to uh, uh, remind you is a question that was asked by some students is uh, that was, uh, what is the kinematic inversion? They said that they had seen it in their machine dynamics book, but a or course, and they cannot understand what the kinematic uh, inversion was, or they don't remember. Let me put it this way. When you have a mechanism, when you have a bunch of, let's think about it like that, when you have a bunch of uh, links connected together through joints, which are also known as kinematic pairs, this makes a kinematic chain. For example, a bunch of links connected together with pins in, their out, in the outer space, they make a kinematic chain. And they're kind of useless because if you apply a tiniest little force on it, this will, this will begin to move, the whole thing will, will begin to move as a rigid body and may even rotate. Now, as soon as you fix one of the pieces, then you get a mechanism. Okay, so kinematic inversion means that how many different ways can we actually fix a link? Well, obviously, if you have five links, there's five different ways you can fix them. Fix link number one, fix link number two, number three, number four, and number five. You get five different mechanisms. The question is, are the, these are all called kinematic inversions. Okay, once you fix a link, it becomes a mechanism, and the kinematic inversion, how many of them you have, depends on how many links you've got. Now, are these all different? The answer is not necessarily. Let me give you an example of a four bar linkage that you are, you're familiar with. Uh, now, four bar linkage has four kinematic inversions because there's four different ways that you can fix a fix uh, fix uh, things okay now when you do that you see that you either get double crank for example what you see in a, a locomotive a locomotive where you have uh, wheels turning and there are these crossbars which are turning with it so you have you can have double crank or you can have double rocker or you can have a crank rocker such as what you use in a wiper blade of a of a car now, in the particular case of four, uh, four bar linkage, although there are four inversions, but, but there's only three distinct ones because the distinct ones are double rocker, double crank, and a crank rocker. So that's what kinematic inversion is. Okay. Now, the second thing that we're going to discuss is Coriolis, Coriolis acceleration, and these other ones, and I'm going to worry about them later on. So let me go to the business of Coriolis acceleration that you saw in your dynamics class. Whenever you have a rotating object and on it, there is a, an ant, for example, that is moving, there will be Coriolis acceleration associated with this relative motion. So if you wanna know what is the total 
acceleration of this ant, knowing that it is moving on that ro on that rotating bot uh, rotating object, the object itself is rotating, and this guy is moving on it, then you have the five term acceleration formula. And here it is. For example, if you look at this body, which is, uh, for example, we, we use it as a as, as a reference point B, is accelerating, for example, at B, and it's rotating, then the acceleration of the ant, think about this point A B, being the ant, is made of five terms. Acceleration of the body, body itself at, at, at this reference point B, and there is this guy, which is called alpha crossed with R, uh, uh, R uh, relative uh, R A with respect to B. This is called Euler, Euler term, Euler acceleration term. This is the centripetal because of the, uh, the, the motion, uh, the rotary motion and centripetal. This is kind of the R omega squared that you're used to. There is the relative acceleration of the ant, the very last one, because the guy is walking on it. Or moving on it, therefore it has an acceleration relative to the point B, relative to this rotating system, and then there is this Coriolis acceleration, which is the cross product of the angular uh, acceleration, angular uh, uh, angular velocity of the rotating body, and the relative velocity of the end. This is what is called the Coriolis acceleration. Okay. So what I want to do is a problem today, which mimics this. So we have a cylinder here, which is mounted on this shaft, and this shaft itself is rotating about the space. So this is the end that is walking on that piece, and the piece itself is rotating, in this case, very simple rotation, about this axis. Okay? Now, uh, let me remind you, I mean, we already showed you what this thing is. It's 2 omega cross with V relative, okay? But if you uh, look at this particular situation, uh, 2 omega cross with V, this is V relative, uh, this thing is a vector, of course. And if you take its uh, ve vector, which will be in, in perpendicular direction to omega and V, and if you take its magnitude, is going to be 2 times the magnitude of omega times the magnitude of v. And for the particular problem that I'm going to be doing, I'm going to assume that this is turning at the uh, 60 RPM, which means 1 hertz, uh, one hertz or uh, 2 pi radians per second. So this omega in radians per second is 2 pi. And the, the ant is walking at the distance uh, I'm sorry, at, at the velocity of uh, 6 inches per second. So if you multiply this out, 2 times omega times V relative, you get the magnitude of the Coriolis acceleration, which comes out to be 75.4 for this particular problem. So you can think about it, although this is not, there is there is no force acting on that ant, but the ant, the ant, you can, you can, if you're rotating with the, you're, if you're rotating with the, the uh, with with the turntable or with this arm, you think that the ant will be feeling a mass, uh, sorry, a force of the acceleration to omega cross v times this mass. This is called a virtual force or the Coriolis force, which is not really there, but is perceived is perceived by by an observer who's rotating with the arm. Okay. I strongly suggest that you go to the internet and type uh, type uh, Coriolis uh, Coriolis acceleration MIT OCW and you see a bunch of beautiful videos there which actually shows it to you. We don't have the time to do that, and I hope that when the course was taught to you by in in in, in the dynamics uh, uh, dynamics course uh, two years ago, uh, uh, some of these things were uh, were brought to your attention. Some of these uh, re Video resources, but anyway, you can you can do it yourself now. Okay, so uh, this is uh, pretty much it. So I'm going to create these things. There is going to be a base. There is going to be an arm, and there's a color on it. Okay, so let's go ahead based on these dimensions. Although these dimensions don't have any significance, what is important is the angular velocity of this arm and the uh, velocity, relative velocity of the ant uh, compared or 
uh, as measured by this uh, uh, arm, uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll go with these dimensions. So let's go ahead and immediately save this thing, file, save management. This is save as, there is my desktop, there is my folder, and I will call this thing uh, uh, Coriolis. Coriolis. Let me start with the base. So insert, insert a new part in there. And I'm going to call this thing the base properties base and base. Let's make it. All it is is a cylinder. So on that plane, I will sketch a cylinder like that. And uh, let me just dimension this so that I have a rough idea how, how big these things are. So this is radius, uh, let's make it radius of one. Okay, exit. Where's the exit? Right there. Pad it. Uh, I'll make it by point, uh, point 0.4. Okay, so this is gonna be our base. So let me change the rendering here so that we can see things better. Uh, this is the wireframe. Okay, so is that the one? Yeah, good. So we go here, insert, insert a new part in there, and I'm going to call this thing the arm. Properties, arm, and arm. This is the rotating arm that I'm talking about. Let's make it. On that plane, we will sketch uh, a circle of uh, radius 0.5 because I'm really consistent with this drawing here, although it may means nothing. 0.5. Yeah. Exit. And I'm going to pad this thing by uh, maybe uh, one. Okay, good. Now, I need to draw this arm that's sticking out of that, uh, that, that piece that's sticking out of that. So I'll go here on that vertical plane. On this vertical plane, I will sketch a tiny circle here. Let me zoom in. Circle. Right there, exit, pad it. I think I made it eight inches, so let's see now that this is totally irrelevant, this actual size of the thing. Okay, good, good. Okay, so now we're gonna, uh, yeah, so we're gonna go there, all the way to the top, save everything. Let's do the color, so insert, insert a new part say no and this is going to be right click properties color color i think it's like that yeah let's make it so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to do it on this face on this face, I will sketch. Let me fit this thing. I'm going to project that circle. There we are. Here's the normal view. Let's, because it's going to be a cylinder, hollow cylinder, so I'm going to draw another circle here. Okay, exit. And we'll pad it by, uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, uh, 0.5. Let me look a little bit shorter than what you see in the draw, in the in, in the slide, but that's okay. Now, because later on I want to plot the Coriolis uh, acceleration here, for example, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a point there. While I'm in this color, I'm going to say create a point, and center of a circle is the method that I'm going to use. There it is. It's, it's created there. 
So we go all the way to the top, save everything, and let's go assemble. Now, uh, what, uh, what, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, anchor the base. So there is the anchor, anchor the base, and then I'm going to move things apart so that I can see it. Uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, I'm going to say uh, uh, coincidence between this axis and that axis. This is easy. I don't have to uh, move it. And then coincidence between this plane and the bottom plane of the cylinder of the arm. Let me remind you: there's a trick that you can use in order to get to the bottom of that uh, arm. If you put the cursor on the curved surface and use the arrows, the arrows on your keyboard, which goes up, down, right, left, right, you you're going to be marching through the different things that cannot be done. And I'm pretty sure this is what we want. That's what we want. Okay, this is going to become a uh, later on. It's going to become a uh, uh, revolution. joint. Now, there's nothing to update because I did not move things around. So I'm going to now. The only thing is that I'm going to translate this thing in the direction x so that it's easier to see what's going on here. Okay, I want this thing to be a prismatic joint because if I make it cylindrical, I know that this has to slide on this, but if I make it cylindrical, there is an extra degree of freedom that has to be specified. So if I make it prismatic, uh, there's no need to do that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say uh, a coincidence between the axis of this uh, cylinder and the axis of that arm, and coincidence between uh, the vertical plane, a vertical plane of... Uh, of the cylinder vertical plane of the uh, of the arm. Now the reason because I did things uh, in a very organized way, I think, <laughs> so I can do that from the tree. So the y z plane. Let me see now. Uh, the x z plane. You can see that this is the x z plane, not the base, not the base. Cancel that. Not that. Let's try it again. The x z plane of the arm. There we are, and the x z plane of the collar. And this is going to make it a prismatic joint. Again, there's nothing to update because that's how these things work. Now, uh, can we check this? In other words, can I go to the move, uh, move toolbar, check this box, and then say, okay, let me uh, rotate this. Now, of course, it's going to move, but uh, uh, the cylinder, uh, you know, it's not related to this movement right now. Later on, this is a two degree of freedom system. You can see that because the rotation of this arm and the, the translation of the cylinder are independent. Of, this is not a single degree of freedom, okay? A uh, single degree of freedom system. Later on, we're gonna tie them to the, uh, the, uh, the equations, okay? Related to time. So that's fine. So let me cancel that. Fine. Good, I save everything. Now we're going to go to Digital Markup, DMU Kinematics. Get the magic wand out. There's a magic wand right there. Oh, let's see, I forgot to say, let me just try it again. I forgot to say, uh, create a mechanism. Try it again. New mechanism, mechanism number one, auto create. You say, okay, needless to say, you're going to have one revolute joint and one prismatic joint. That's why the degree of freedom is two. Okay, good. So now we're going to put the physics into the problem. Okay, so we go to, we go to f of x, click on the mechanism, and notice that there are no commands specified here. So this is time, no problem. That means I have to cancel this. I go there, revolute, I make this thing angle driven. Okay. And uh, I don't have to, I don't have to uh, change this thing to zero, but I always like to do that. This, this is totally irrelevant. And this one, prismatic, angle driven, starting from zero, going all the way to eight inches. Obviously, mechanism can be simulated, 
but there's going to be two sliding bars. So if you click on the simulation with commands, you see that there's two sliding bars. One of them is responsible for the motion, the angular motion. The other one is responsible for the motion of the cylinder. You can see that. Good. So now we're going to go to f of x and click on the mechanism. Notice that these commands show up. This is where you put the physics. So this is the angle. So I selected it. Add a formula equal to. Now remember, 360 uh, 60 RPM is uh, uh, one round per second. Yeah which means 360 degrees per second. But if you want, you can just type one turn per minute, instead of writing 360 degrees per second, times, uh, Katia understands this, times the time. Now you might say, well, the left side is angle uh, in, in, in degrees, the right side is not in degrees, but it looks like Katia will understand that. But if you have any doubts, you can always change that. Please try it yourself, we'll see whether you like it or not. 360 DEG underscore S. If you feel more comfortable, there we are. Good. And this is the velocity, this is the velocity, relative velocity of that cylinder. So add a formula and equal to, I think I said six inches per second, six, six I N per S. This was given in the statement of the problem per S per second times time. Good, so now we have physics. Okay, so let's go and do a simulation with laws. Simulation with laws. Not here. Uh, where is that? Right here. Simulation with laws, right there. We want to do it over a one second uh, period, not 10 seconds. So we make this thing one. And we say okay. And then we play it. It turns once, and this goes by six inches. You might say, okay, it looks good, but how do I know the physics is in the problem? Well, we are going to have to create sensors. So we go here to, uh, there we are, speed and acceleration sensor. You say, okay, reference, uh, reference product is the base. And the point is that point, remember I created a point at the end of this cylinder, right, right there? Say, okay. Good. Incidentally, if you created the trace, this, trace of this, it will go on a spiral, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. So uh, now we're going to say simulation with laws, activate sensors. Okay, so let's see now. There is no such a thing as Coriolis acceleration. There is X, Y, Z component of the acceleration, and then there's the magnitude of the acceleration, for example, which doesn't say magnitude, actually. It says, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, a linear linear acceleration this is the magnitude okay so let's uh, let's actually do the magnitude now notice that I, I said yes right notice that this is a constant rotation therefore there is no uh, uh, there is no Euler term there is no alpha or there is no theta dot okay uh, there is a centripetal centripetal one because this is rotating and there's the Coriolis one because the point is moving while this is rotating. So we're going to, we're going to figure this out. Okay. So let me move this thing out of the way and we're going to play this thing. Okay. And then we're going to graph it. All right. So, uh, what is the unit here? Let's make sure that inch per second squared, very good. Okay. Per second squared, good. So let's see if this, this whole thing makes sense. When this guy, when this guy starts, it is already a certain distance away, a certain distance away from the center of uh, rotation. So definitely, there is that term, the r omega squared, OK? 
okay? This is your R omega squared. You know what omega is, it's two pi, okay? But there is an R because that point is already, I think one and a half inches or something like that away from the center of rotation. There's this term, but it's pointing toward the, uh, the arm. It's pointing towards the arm, okay? Right, what do I mean by that? It is pointing, let me move this the other way. It is pointing this way. That is the centripetal one. The Coriolis one is going to be omega crossed with V, which means in a tangential direction, this way. Okay. So when you do the magnitude, both of these are combined and they're done as a square root of one squared plus the other one squared. So what I'm gonna do instead, let me go back here. Let me rewind this thing. Let me go back and here clear the history, clear the history. For the selection, I'm not going to do the magnitude because when you do magnitude, the centripetal one and the Coriolis one is underneath the radical square of each one of them. So let me say, for example, acceleration in the y direction. Linear acceleration in the y direction. Okay, there. Let me get rid of the other one. I think uh, I already, uh, let me get rid of the y. Y is good. Uh, the magnitude, I got rid of it. Oh, there, I don't want this. I just want the magnitude. I just want the acceleration in the y direction, which I selected right there. And then play it. And then graph it. Aha. Now. Notice that, notice that what we have here is, uh, uh, of course, uh, this thing, this thing is, uh, if you look at it, uh, uh, let me see for a second, your 75, 75 right there, 75 at this location, I know that uh, I know that the Coriolis is in the in the y direction, and at this location, uh, at the final location, uh, I know that the Coriolis in the y direction. And guess what this value is? It is seventy, uh, whatever seventy five point something. Okay. So this location, if you look at it, halfway between these two, and it is going to be this calculation that I did for you. Please think about these things and uh, and uh, work it out. It is possible to use different components, but uh, it's gonna take some, some time and I'm not uh, worried about it right now. Okay, so let's move on to our next problem. That takes care of, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, there is this last item here, instead of print screen, Remember, suppose I ask you to generate this for me and submit it as part of your exam. You already know what to do. First of all, zoom out so that I can see everything, units and uh, you know legends and things like that. Then you do a print screen. And then you create a Word file and paste it. And then you save, the, save that Word, uh, Word document with the name that you want and just give me this one file. Nothing, not this one plot, nothing else. And then you save it and submit as well. But there's something else you can do. Look here. There is this, if you look at your, your windows, get your windows right there, see that right there? There is something called tools, image, capture. Okay. Over here, it says capture, click. It creates a PDF file. Instead of you do a print screen and then paste it and then save it, what you do, you go to tools, image, capture, and then save it. There's the full Coriolis, and I could call it my capture. captured plot. 
So later on, when you submit your work in that folder, also upload that one PDF file. It's up to you. I don't care how you do it. I want a plus like this. Okay. Whether you do print screen, paste, save, or whether you do tools, image, capture, and then save it, it's up to you. All right. So let me uh, close this. That's what this last item in the agenda is. Instead of print screen, one can use tools, capture, save. Is it tools, image? I can't remember. Let's see. Tools, image. Yeah. Tools, image, capture, and then save. Okay. So, tools, image. <laughs> image. Capture. Okay, next item. We want to talk about the prelude to human, human building. In CATIA, there is a, uh, if you look at the start menu that you're familiar with, there is something called ergonomics, ergonomics design and analysis. And in here, there is a, a workbench called, uh, or a module or app called human builder. And you can insert different mannequins uh, here's a male, here's a female, they're different percentiles. In other words, uh, uh, you want a 50 percentile, normal one, or you want a, uh, I don't know, uh, 100, 100 percentile, something that may be very skinny, etc., etc. And you, you can even have nation, nationality, believe it or not, it gives you the option of choosing a, a, a Canadian, American, uh, French, uh, Chinese, and uh, I think there was one other one, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, but uh, it, it looks like that. Uh, they don't look very good, very, very basic. What they have done in the Katia, in, in the version of the Katia that is in the 3D experience, uh, and I told you writing is on the wall, everything you're going to be doing there, everything is the same except that the interface is different, icons are different. But as long as you know your Katia V5, then it's very easy to adjust it. They have arranged a bunch of new mannequins and these new mannequins as far as the wardrobe goes as far as the makeup goes you have a opportunity to adjust it so you can use these or a whole bunch of other ones that you can use different postures etc so uh, i'm not going to do that i told you that in this in this setup, uh, all the joints in the bodies of the mannequin are made. Even the eyesight and things like that can be adjusted. And in fact, uh, some of the, I've seen that uh, happening with the capstone project, people who are doing Formula One or uh, uh, I don't know, the other one, Mini Bar, they, 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 they design the thing in Katia and then they, they take a mannequin and put it there. And in fact, it is very useful because you can do a reach analysis. In other words, once you have an object here, you can ask uh, uh, Katia to generate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the reach uh, uh, envelope, uh, whether you, the, the hand can reach that point, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, just to let you know that there is something like that. Now, the last item on the agenda for today is a wheel rolling on a path. And I'm going to show you one way of doing it. This is not necessarily the best way. There are other ways, but uh, now I have already done something like that in the class. And in fact, your homework, uh, your homework in, in this week has to do with that. But uh, here's the situation. <clears throat> I want to create a wheel that is rolling along a path that I have created. Now, the one that I did in class for you last week, I believe it was, this wheel was actually rolling along that side line, that edge. I want to show you what can you do to actually make it roll along a path. Okay? Now. So let's go here. 
I don't need this. I don't need this. I'm gonna save that. So first, let me remind you of how to do it along that side edge. So we go here, let's start with the product, because this is an assembly, but this is a mechanism. Insert the ground, insert a new part in there. And I'm going to call this thing the ground properties. Ground. and ground okay let's make it double click on a convenient plane on that horizontal plane i will sketch why don't i draw a rectangle like that exit pad it okay that, that's good good now the wheel so insert a new part i'll call it the wheel okay let's make it so on a convenient plane on that vertical plane, I will sketch. I'll sketch a, a circle. Now let me give it a, a radius of uh, one. Okay. Okay, good. Now, exit, pad it. Uh, that's fine. So let me make this thing point, uh, point 0.5. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so, uh, now I want to make this thing roll on that edge. This is what I did for you last week. So first thing I want to do is Make sure that these are uh, flush. So let's go to the assembly design. I'm going to anchor the base first. Base is, the base is fixed or the ground is, is, is anchored. So coincidence between this plane and that plane. And as soon as I upset, uh, as soon as, as soon as I uh, update it, it moves this thing and makes it flush here. Now I want to bring this thing down and there are different ways of doing it. One is to go, if you want, you can go to, you can go to that sketch where you drew the, the wheel right there. You can go to the sketch and make this thing tangent to that line. That's one way of doing it. It's entirely up to you. Or I can go to my uh, assembly and then use contact. Contact between this face and that face. And this internal external is important. One may look like what you want and one does not. We say okay and update and obviously this is not what you want. Okay, so we go back here and you say don't do it internal, do it external. And of course, I'm pretty sure you know what it means internal, external, externally tangent to each other. Okay, good. Now, what we want to do is uh, we want to make this thing roll uh so what, what what we need to do is first of all remember i made this coincident with that that's why i pushed it here and uh made these surfaces flush this will lead into a planar joint later on that will give you a planar joint this contact will not give you anything okay so let's go to the digital markup dmu kinematic Get the magic wand out, say new mechanism, auto create. Okay. And if you check, there will be only one 
uh, planar joint right there. Now I have to do the roll curve joint myself. If I want this thing to roll, by the way, uh, in order for me to see that this is actually rolling, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to the wheel. I'm going to go back to the wheel. Good. I'm going to draw a circle on that face. Draw a circle so that I can actually see that it is rolling. Right there. Exit. Uh, how about uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, pocket it, pad it, whatever you want. There. Okay. Good, good. So back to the mechanism. Now we're going to do a roll curve joint. Here's a roll curve joint. Look at all the joints that you've got. We have beat this thing to death uh, and uh, pretty much all of them except for one or two we may have done. So we go to roll curve, roll curve. I want this circle to roll on that circle. And notice that there is a length, uh, there is a length driven command here. This is why degree of freedom is one. If I go to that roll curve and make it angle uh, uh, length driven, not angle driven, and we say okay, and you can see what's going to happen now. Uh, so if you go and try to do this manually, right there. Okay. Now let me put it in zero position. It really doesn't matter. I'll just leave it there. Doesn't matter. Now, this is fine. I could have done this thing a different way. And what do I mean by that? Let me delete this. Delete this joint. Let me go and create a point. Let me go and create a point. By, by the way, let me undo this. Let me undo that. What happens if I delete this? What if I, what if I deleted this planar joint? Don't delete the children. Notice that the degree of freedom is one. I need that planar joint. Okay. So the way I'm going to do that is, is, is uh, I'm not going to use the planar joint. I'm going to draw a, a, a line up here, which is one inch away from the ground and a point over there and put that thing as a point curve joint. So first of all, let's go to the wheel. Let's go to the wheel and create a point at the center of that circle. There we are. And then I go to the base or the ground and I create a line which is one inch away from that. So let me do it like this. A line uh, which is uh, point and direction, point and direction. Uh, this is the easiest way for me to do it. You can do it any way you want. From this point, in the direction uh, x, right? Direction x. Okay, so let's make it like that. In this direction. And I want to go in the other direction. Come on. Okay, good. All right. Good. So now we're going to go to mechanism. And we create a point curve joint. A point curve joint. The curve is this. The point is that. Length driven. If I say OK, this is still going to be. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be. Uh, I don't need to make it length driven because the, the, the roll curve was length driven. You can see what happens. Same thing. The choice is yours. I could have done it with a planar and roll curve. I can do it with a point and roll curve, etc. Now, this is going to help me to do the actual problem that I want to do. The actual problem was actually a path here, and you get the idea. Okay, so I draw this path. I uh, can translate this path up here and make a point curve. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, uh, first thing I'm going to do is, uh, I don't need this, this, this line, so uh, uh, I'm going to hide this. Okay. Let me go to the assembly design. Oh, cancel, cancel. Let me go to the, to, the, to the ground here. I'm in the ground. On that face, I will draw. For example, 
a path. And the path can be, for example, uh, with the different ways of doing it. Let, let me let me let me do this. Let me do this. From here to here to here. Or I could have drawn, drawn a twine, etc. The only reason I drew a straight line here is easier for me to put that uh, uh, wheel in the right spot. So let me do this. Go to the assembly design. Oh, uh, before I do that, uh, yeah, okay. Let me let me go there. Let me go there to the uh, to the uh, assembly and put this thing in the right spot. So how am I going to do this? Uh, assembly design. Good. So let me move these things. Let me make, for example, move these so that it's more reasonable as far as the location is concerned. In the Y, it goes like that. Okay. And then I'm going to translate it in the direction X, like so. Okay. And then let's see if I can make this coincident with that. So that line, control this. Let's see if we can make it coincident. Well, or, 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 or you can make a zero, zero distance. Here, here is the offset. Uh, okay, sorry, between that and this, uh, zero. So that it just, did it do it? No, that's not, that's, that's not a good idea. This, this is not going to do. Let me do it a different way. Oh. Okay, good. Let me try coincidence. Coincidence between this face and that. Let's see if it does it. Update. Okay, it did it. Now, I think I had another constraint here. Let's check the, one of these constraints. This guy, remember I made this edge coincident with that? Let, let me delete this. This is the one that's not working. And that message that I got was uh, because it said that, hey, I can't do that. You're telling me that this to be on coincident pretty much with that, et cetera. But, but there we are. Okay, good, good. So now we're gonna go and uh, uh, I'll, I'll do exactly the same thing. First of all, I have to take this sketch and translate it up by one inch. So how do I do this? Well, first of all, we go to that to that part, okay? Because I wanna take this curve, this sketch and translate it up. Uh, let's see if we can do it here. Uh, maybe we can, I don't know. Translate, let's see. That sketch. No, the problem is that I want to move that sketch, so this is not going to work here. So let's change workbenches. Let's go to uh, uh, generative uh, shape design. Okay. All right, let's do the translate here. Uh, find the translate, and this, uh, you see, in, in here I told you what to do. Uh, this is the, on the operations toolbar. Under the operations toolbar, there's the operations tool, toolbar. And this is translate, I believe. Yeah, translate. You select that sketch and you say move it in the direction Z by one inch. Uh, one inch. This is why I make sure that this radius was one inch so that I can. There we are. You see this? There we go. Okay. So you're going to go back to mechanism. Back to mechanism. There we are. Let's get rid of uh, uh, let's get rid of these and do it again. So I'm going to delete this. I'm going to delete that. Okay. I'm going to make a point curve between this point and that curve. So where is this? Uh, oh, I have to I have to be in the digital markup, right? Yeah. Good. So let's do a point curve. There is the point curve between uh, that sketch. Uh, the one thing I don't like is because these things, this seems that they're not connected. If necessary, we can, we can actually go ahead and do a, a, a join here. Okay. We may have to do that. I'm not sure. Let's find out. Uh, can I, let's try it again. So, uh, a point curve, 
between this sketch, right? This sketch or this translate. The translate was uh, where was the translate that I created? Uh, that was under the ground, right? Let's see. Okay, no, I, I went to the tree. I went to the tree. I went to the tree. Instead of selecting individual pieces here, I went to the tree on the ground, on the, under the ground part, uh, select the translate. And for the point, I'm going to select that point, center, remember? And then I come here and do a roll curve. So we go here, do a roll curve between that sketch now that sketch was this okay and this edge and then say okay let's see how many degrees of freedom degree of freedom one i can either make this thing point uh, uh make this point curve length driven or make this roll curve length driven i'll make the roll curve length driven so in the other direction uh, the only thing is that I cannot flip the direction here. Cancel that. Cancel that. Let's try to make this thing just point curve one uh, length driven. Uh, because this one I can flip. Uh, well, let me do that. No problem. Okay. So uh, we say okay. Okay, let's check it. The only problem is that this will go that way. I don't want it to go that way. Oh, no, it is okay. It is okay. Okay. So I did not have to worry about those. So this is how you make, you can make it go along a,